Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 41, Mission Control. Last time, we wrapped up our coverage of Apollo 12 by riding along for the dusty pinpoint landing. Commander Pete Conrad and Lunar Module Pilot Alan Bean performed two EVAs, each nearly four hours long. While out there, they deployed a bunch of science experiments, whacked a radioactive thing with a hammer, destroyed a TV camera, and chopped a different TV camera off a defenseless robot. I'm not sure what the intrepid crew had against TV cameras, but that's probably beyond the scope of this podcast. The mission was a perfect follow-up to the trailblazing flight of Apollo 11 just a few short months earlier. It not only proved we could perform another landing, but that we could perform a precision landing and collect a bunch of useful scientific data while we were at it. The next mission, Apollo 13, would build on these accomplishments. Their landing zone would be in the hilly Framaro region, where a bunch of good science was hiding out. They'd also have more of a focus on science than any previous mission, dedicating themselves to lengthy geological training. I don't think it's a spoiler for listeners of this podcast to tell you that things didn't quite work out that way. Apollo 13 would not be landing at Framaro. Instead, they would endure one of the most trying ordeals and dramatic stories in all of human spaceflight, shepherded through the void by an organization that we have paid far too little attention thus far. Mission Control. So, O2 Tank 2 is going to have to hang tight for one more episode, because today we'll be talking about Mission Control. Where did it come from? Who influenced it? What was its role in the Apollo missions? And what the heck did positions like FIDO, TELMU, or NETWORK do anyway? Before we can talk about any of that, though, we need to talk about the creator of Mission Control, Chris Kraft. Really, the idea of Mission Control was forged by a team of people and the times in which they lived, just like any other large organization, but if there was ever one guy you could point to and say, there he is, the father of Mission Control, it was Chris Kraft. Christopher Columbus Kraft Jr. was born on February 24th, 1924, in Phoebus, Virginia. When he was a kid, he wasn't all that interested in airplanes, but instead was obsessed with baseball. He played as much as he was able to, despite a pretty significant burn he sustained to his hand in an accident when he was three years old. He attended the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which has since become Virginia Tech, and studied mechanical engineering. The year was 1941, which you might call fairly infamous. It turns out that accidental burn would have a huge impact on not only his life, but world history. That's because when Kraft attempted to enlist in the Navy to do his part in World War II, he was turned away due to his injured hand. The Navy told him to stay in college and do his part for the war on the home front. He completed college and accepted a job offer from the NACA, predecessor to NACA. Fast forwarding a bunch, Kraft was one of the early core members of the Space Task Group, the NASA organization run by Bob Gilruth that was tasked with getting a human into space before the Russians. Kraft was in charge of organizing flight operations for the upcoming Mercury missions. Flight operations was not a new concept. When testing a new airplane, the test pilot needed a ground crew to help the test go smoothly. Someone to keep an eye on the data coming down from the test and the overall plan for the flight but you also wanted an engineer close at hand to answer any questions about problems that might arise. And if things went really sideways, it was helpful to have someone keeping an eye on contingency operations, someone to call the fire crew or organize a search and rescue. At first, it was thought that Mercury might be similar to any other experimental aircraft, but that soon proved to not be the case. At the end of the day, even the most advanced, fire-breathing, high-flying airplanes on Earth, such as the X-15, were tested in a relatively small area. The X-15 ate up hundreds of miles in one run, but the entire trajectory was contained in southern Nevada. Kraft and his team quickly realized that Mercury was a whole other ballgame. Let's look at just the suborbital flights. A piece of cake compared to the orbital flights, even these missions were incredibly complex. Dozens of streams of telemetry needed to be monitored to assess the health of the booster and the spacecraft. People were needed on the ground who could interpret that data and make decisions quickly as to the best course of action. 
And since the tiny Mercury spacecraft would be flying over the Florida horizon, additional tracking sites were necessary, as well as a network to connect them all. Once you expanded that to orbital flight, with tracking stations and telecommunications network links crisscrossing the world and a supercomputer up at the Goddard Space Flight Center a thousand miles away from the launch pad, you're talking about serious complexity. Mission Control was full of people who were razor smart, passionate, and committed, but who also barely knew what they were doing. That's not to cast aspersions, it was just also new. Literally no one on Earth knew how to do what they were doing. A major formative event for the MCC, originally Mercury Control Center, but quickly changed to Mission Control Center, was the 4-inch flight of Mercury Redstone 1. The first ever test flight of a Mercury spacecraft atop a Redstone booster ended in massive confusion just seconds after it began. We talked about this about a billion episodes ago, but thanks to a slightly short umbilical cable, the rocket almost immediately shut down its engine and settled back on the launch cradle. Shortly after that, the parachute deployed, sonar depth charges fired, and a bunch of aluminum foil meant to increase radar visibility rained down over the scene like some sort of mocking confetti. In the MCC, nobody was sure what had happened. The booster officer conferred with his colleagues in the blockhouse in their native German as Kraft, the flight director, became increasingly agitated about the lack of answers. The four-inch flight wound up being a harmless and humorous anecdote, even if it was a bit of a black eye for NASA at the time, but it became an early formative event for mission control. They had been caught off guard. They didn't know what had happened, why it had happened, or what to do about it. They couldn't let themselves be caught off guard again. Another event that would resonate throughout the history of mission control was during John Glenn's three-orbit ride aboard Friendship 7. There was a disagreement about how to interpret telemetry that indicated the heat shield may be loose. Kraft, serving as flight director at the time, was overruled by his boss, Walt Williams, and Glenn was told to keep the retro rockets in place with the hopes that they would hold on a loose heat shield. After Glenn was safely recovered, the rules were updated such that no one, not even the president, could overrule a NASA flight director. You could fire them, but you couldn't overrule them. Mission Control really cut their teeth during the heady days of Project Gemini. For two years, a new mission launched every two months, often trying something that had never been done before. Mission Control had to learn how to deal with multi-day, sometimes multi-week missions, how to communicate with multiple spacecraft at once, and how to handle an unfolding emergency in orbit. Then came January 1967. The loss of the crew of Apollo 1 sent shockwaves throughout the entire NASA organization, and Mission Control took it to heart. The decision to use a pure oxygen environment wasn't theirs. The decision to use an inward opening door wasn't theirs, and they didn't cause the spark that initiated the fire. But Mission Control owned that accident. Flight director Gene Kranz delivered a legendary speech, which I recited in episode 30, which contained a new mantra for Mission Control. Tough and competent. Good wasn't good enough. Mission Control would be perfect. They would know everything, handle everything, and be accountable for everything. In the space flight business, there was just no alternative. And the tough and competent attitude is what allowed 12 men to look up at the Earth with dust on their boots and what allowed the crew of Apollo 13 to see their families again. Mission Control has changed in appearance over the years, evolving alongside the missions they support, but it was perhaps most iconic during the Apollo era. Let's take a look inside the Mission Operations Control Room as seen during the Apollo program. As you entered the room, the first thing that would catch your eye is a large wall of various displays at the front of the room. These displays contained information that was critical to all mission controllers and could be updated throughout the mission. In the Mercury days, it was a world map dotted with ground stations and their communication ranges. A small model Mercury capsule would be mechanically moved along its orbital path. In Apollo, the display could be changed to a number of things, from trajectory updates during launch to live video from the surface of the moon. 
Once you could tear your eyes from the glut of information being projected on the front wall, you'd notice that the room was organized into rows of specialized consoles, with each row being slightly raised compared to the row in front of it like gentle stadium seating. Each row was composed of a series of specialized stations, each one tweaked to better support their facet of the mission, though some features were common to all. Each station had a number of lights and buttons that allowed the mission controllers to communicate with each other, with the flight director, and with the back rooms that helped support them. Most accounts of mission control seem to just mention these back rooms of specialists in passing without really getting into them, so let's keep up that tradition. For this next bit, I've drawn from a number of sources, but the skeleton comes from an excellent Ars Technica article from 2012, which goes into detail about each of the mission control stations during the Apollo era. So if you'd like to go more in detail, as well as see some cool photos, just Google Apollo Flight Controller 101. Starting on the left side of the front row, you find the booster console. The booster officer was responsible for, you guessed it, everything to do with the Saturn V rocket. During the few minutes of ascent, things could happen fast, just ask Pete Conrad, so it was important to have people dedicated to keeping an eye on the rocket's performance. Once the S-4B finished the translunar injection, these controllers were done. To the right of Booster was Retro. Retro was originally named after the Retro rockets mounted at the base of the Mercury capsule, but the Apollo era role was expanded from that. They were responsible for getting the spacecraft back, so their busiest time was in the final hours of the mission as re-entry approached. However, they could also find themselves at the center of attention pretty quickly if an abort was called for during ascent. Next was FDO, pronounced FIDO. FIDO was the Flight Dynamics Officer, a role I've become a lot more familiar with over the last year and a half thanks to my work with the Earth Observation System Flight Dynamics team. Flight Dynamics can be summed up as, where were we, where are we, where are we going? FIDO's job was to monitor trajectories and help plan maneuvers to update that trajectory as necessary. Need to get back on a free return trajectory? FIDO's got you covered. Need to know how your parking orbit looks after S-4B shutdown? Talk to FIDO. During ascent, FIDO was so cued into the rocket's trajectory that he was the only person other than the flight director who could issue an abort call. And last in the front row was Guido, the guidance officer. The Guido role was sort of the other side of the coin of Fido. He was responsible for the care and feeding of the onboard guidance systems, which provided the critical data for Fido to be able to determine the spacecraft's trajectory. Need to know if the pings and ags are in close agreement, or what the hell a 1202 program alarm is? Guido has the answers. These four positions were collectively called the trench. It was a nod to both their physical location as the lowest row in the room, but also the extreme siege-like pressure they found themselves in during critical moments. Moving up a row and back over to the left, we find the perceived enemy of astronauts everywhere, Surgeon. Surgeon was manned by the Flight Surgeon, a doctor dedicated to the health and well-being of the crew. Astronauts rarely liked the flight surgeon since it was their job to decide if an astronaut was healthy enough to withstand the rigors of spaceflight. Since most astronauts would be happy to crawl directly from a hospital bed straight into the cockpit, surgeon's advice was rarely welcomed. They used data from sensors attached to the crew's bodies to keep an eye on heart rate, temperature, and whether the crew was actually sleeping in their rest periods, among other things. To the right of Surgeon was CAPCOM, short for Capsule Communicator. I was always a little surprised that even from the first Mercury flight, they got this position right. Only one person was allowed to talk to the crew, and that was CAPCOM. And CAPCOM was nearly always the only type of person who could truly understand what the crew was experiencing. Another astronaut. I say I was surprised because I could easily imagine an alternate history where during the first flight, all of the mission control guys tried to talk to the astronaut at once, or where some technician with no flight experience tried manning the position. Other than a few exceptions, when you hear Houston talking to the astronauts, you're hearing Capcom. Next to Capcom was ECOM, short for Electrical, Environmental, and Communications. This station was responsible for essentially anything with electricity running through the command and service module, which was a lot, 
This was the station manned by John Aaron when he made his famous set SCE to Ox call during the Apollo 12 ascent. It may also be a station more known to the general public thanks to the memorable portrayal of ECOM officer Cy Liebergott by Clint Howard in the film Apollo 13. Next up, GNC, or Guidance, Navigation, and Control. Where Guido told us where the spacecraft thought it was pointed, and Fido told us where it needed to point, GNC was responsible for actually pointing the thing. This hardware-oriented role focused on the status of the Reaction Control System and SPS. Sitting to GNC's right was TELMU, or Telemetry, Electrical, and EVA Mobility Unit. I've always remembered TELMU as ECOM, but for everything but the CSM. Need to know about the temperature in the spacesuit of an astronaut on the surface of the moon, or how long the LEM's batteries can hold a charge? TELMU is who you need to talk to. And rounding out the second row was Control. Control is sort of like TELMU in that you can kind of call it GNC for everything other than the CSM. This station was responsible for the LEM's attitude control and navigation hardware. When Eagle's landing radar got a solid lock on the lunar surface, these guys were the first to know about it. Moving up to the third row, we have INCO, the Instrumentation and Communications Officer. This job spanned both the CSM and the LEM, and focused purely on the all-important communications link, both voice and data. I'm sure this was a pretty busy station during the Apollo 11 powered descent, as the voice and telemetry link faltered due to the unexpected obstruction of the RCS plume deflector. Next up is Procedures. This is where Gene Kranz got his start. This is slightly off-topic, but to give you an idea of how fast early mission control moved, Kranz served as Procedures for MR1 just one month and four days after he was hired. This role was responsible for making sure that everything was done by the book, and for writing the book in the first place. Launching a spacecraft, landing one on the moon, or bringing it home were all pretty tricky undertakings that required a lot of things to happen at the right time in the right order. Procedures helped maintain that order. While Procedures started out as a sort of assistant flight director position, by the time Apollo rolled around there was an actual assistant flight and he sat to the right of Procedures. The flight director was a pretty busy guy, so having a dedicated assistant could help when things got busy. I'm just speculating here, but I imagine it was also used to allow prospective flight directors to get a feel for their job before being put in the hot seat. Next up was the hot seat itself, flight. The flight director role was akin to that of a conductor in an orchestra. Flight's job wasn't necessarily to know the deepest details of the spacecraft systems, though they often did, but to know who did know those details. If Flight asked you a question, you better have an answer, and fast. During their shift, they had overall responsibility for the mission as a whole. Sitting alongside Flight was FAO, or Flight Activities Officer. This station was responsible for the overall mission plan, which sometimes needed to be planned down to the second. The longer Mercury flights proved that it was best to have some flexibility and slack in the timeline, but you couldn't just wing it either. With three guys on a week-long mission, someone had to keep an eye on what task was scheduled next, and that was FAO. To FAO's right sat Network. While ECOM, TELMU, and INCO ensured that critical spacecraft data got to Earth, Network ensured that it got to Houston. There was no internet in these days, though ARPANET was just getting started, so this was no small feat. Ensuring a robust telecom link between Houston and telemetry stations all over the Earth was no small task, and involved a lot of long-distance phone calls and troubleshooting. Moving up to the final row, we have PAO, or Public Affairs Officer. Initially included almost as an afterthought, PAO would become an iconic position, providing the voice of NASA. The press obviously couldn't be allowed in the mission control room, since they'd be far too distracting. So, the PAO's job was to relay to the outside world just what was happening. When you watch footage of NASA launches and hear a countdown, that's usually the PAO you're hearing. Next to the PAO was the Flight Operations Director. I always thought this job title was a little misleading, since it makes him sound responsible for the mission, which, as we know, is Flight's job. Instead, this position played a similar role to PAO, but getting information to the Manned Spacecraft Center instead. 
If senior management wanted to know what was happening in the room, the flight operations director would have the answers. And moving one step up the food chain, the next console over was manned by NASA HQ. This role performed a similar function as the flight operations director, but interfacing with NASA headquarters. And lastly, we have a console dedicated to the Department of Defense. Since NASA couldn't afford its own navy, it relied on the DoD for recovery operations. Having a DoD official in the room facilitated communication between the two organizations, leading to smooth recoveries. That's a lot of people, but as we'll see in the upcoming episodes, they could all work together like a well-oiled machine. It's really something incredible to behold. I could talk for hours about the intricacies of mission control, but there's one fact that just completely blew my mind. These days, it's easy to look at photos of mission control and imagine that their consoles were essentially computers. Sure, the keyboard is sort of strange, but there's a monitor right there. But no, what they had was far crazier. This was still an era when a computer could easily fill an entire room, let alone a small console, so the computers were kept in the real-time computer complex. Okay, fine. So these computers were responsible for generating the numbers, labels, and graphics shown on the console displays, right? Well, yes and no. The computers could actually only display basic numbers and plots, but not the labels or graphics or formatting around them. To get around this, the raw numbers would be shown on a CRT display, and an overlay card would be physically moved in front of the display. Then, a TV camera pointed at the overlay in CRT and would relay an image to the mission controller's display, making it essentially a closed-circuit TV. It would sort of be like if the Weather Channel just put a bunch of numbers on screen and then held a piece of cardboard in front of the camera that labeled which temperature was for which day. Like so much of the Apollo program, the solution was clever, effective, and completely insane. These days, the Mission Control Center continues fulfilling its role, but now for the International Space Station and hopefully new human missions soon. The building still looks much the same from the outside, but with one notable difference. It is now called the Christopher C. Kraft Jr. Mission Control Center. As we wrap up our dedicated look at Mission Control and see how far it has come from its humble origins, I can't help but think of a quote from Kraft himself. Don't be frightened of it. Go do it and don't be afraid to fail. By the way, if you can't get enough of Mission Control, there's an excellent documentary called Mission Control that's available on Netflix and a whole bunch of other places, so go check it out. Next time, we'll leave Houston in the rearview mirror and set off for the Framaro Highlands and what I'm just going to go ahead right now and call part one of our coverage of Apollo 13. NASA goes for the hat trick on a mission that is sure to make a mark on spaceflight history. So keep your podcast feed current and your cryo tanks stirred. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs> <laughs>